Hi, welcome to another episode of uh, Homeopathy Simplified. I'm Jonathan DeMonte, a homeopath and Bowen therapist. And I, uh, I'll just reintroduce myself, as uh, some of you may not know my background. I first discovered homeopathy through my father in the 60s. His name was John DeMonte, and he was one of the key teachers during homeopathy's resurgence in Europe during the 60s and 70s. And I was fortunate to study homeopathy through his students, and I feel a very strong connection to his career and his life path. I also became a Bowen therapist and developed a practice focusing on chronic pain and disease. So after 27 years, I've come full circle and I want to share my knowledge. I've made a, a purpose of teaching a course that is the one I wished I'd had in the very beginning of my career a course created to make the complex simple and shine a path through a forest of ideas and even misconceptions about homeopathy. So in this episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, just how long does homeopathy actually take in terms of choosing a medicine, and um, not about how long it takes to study. I'll, I'll cover that in another episode, but this is really about how long does it really take to prescribe a medicine. This is for anyone, the kitchen table prescriber to the medical practitioner. And in this episode, I will give some sense of the time frame for using a homeopathic remedy. And um, why? Because there is, I believe, a misconception about how long it actually takes. And it really doesn't have to be long to do it well. And that comes down to a matter of practice. And looking at the dictionary, we see practice is to do something habitually or as a practice, and then to pursue a profession, especially law or medicine. So we see the word used quite a lot in, in medicine and in law, of course, that a person has a practice. But what do they practice? We can all say we practice such and such form of medicine, and a homeopath could practice homeopathy, and there are differences in the way we practice. And primarily, we get good at the way we practice. So there are different schools of thought in homeopathy, and depending on how we've been taught will be the one we use the most. Underpinning my approach to homeopathy is to find the most reliable methods of its use and to adhere at the same time to its fundamental principles. So I'm not going to go into all of those now, but I'm going to define a few of the many different methods and the three primary ones I'm going to talk about are what are called classical homeopathy, keynote prescribing, and prescribing on the pathology or the disease name. And there are many more described methods, and um, these are taught in different schools and practiced in different ways in different countries and so forth. And these are just three. But these represent kind of a foundational concept in, in the practice of homeopathy. I'm not going to talk about miasms, and which are inherited diseases. I'm not going to talk about archetypes of remedies or sequential methods of treatment, as these are about variations of the above. The point I want to make is that the practice of good homeopathy requires, in its simplest form, the observation of the symptoms of the patient in their illness, and then we match those to a remedy that can treat these symptoms. So let's look at these methods one by one. In classical homeopathy, we know it as being based on um, using a single remedy at a time. We don't combine remedies in classical homeopathy. But we choose the medicine based on matching the symptoms of the patient to the symptoms of the medicine. And this is the fundamental principle method of all homeopathy. How we choose the medicine or remedy is what varies. So looking at keynote prescribing, keynote uh, describes how we use a characteristic symptom that is very strong for a particular remedy. So we see this in remedies such as pulsatilla. The pulsatilla state in an illness usually finds the warmth of a room too uncomfortable and is happiest with fresh, cool air and even being outdoors. 
or the rust toxicodendron, rust tox, state of arthritis, is usually relieved when moving or walking, depending on the joint in question. Whereas the Bryonia alba patient, Bryonia alba, in arthritis, cannot bear any movement. So those are known as keynote characteristics, and we can choose those based on how the patient describes their symptoms. And then finally, using pathological means, which means prescribing on the disease name or the injury name, choosing the remedy based upon its most prominent affinity for a particular disease. So we might see this in remedies like Hypericum perfoliatum. This is a, a, a remedy for nerve pain, such as the, when you jam your fingers in the car door, or the effect of belladonna if you have heat stroke. These are very characteristic for those remedies, and they might be the first ones you reach for in the first aid kit as a homeopath. So, how much time does each method take is an important question, as each method is useful, and if we are in a hurry to choose a remedy, we will go for the method that suits the situation. I myself have chosen remedies often, quickly, and based on the methods above. Certainly, the latter two meaning the pathological prescri prescribing or the keynote prescribing, are very time-saving methods. The first is the, um, the classical method is the one that takes the longest, because it requires sifting through a few remedies to choose a single one. In the development of homeopathy, we've always sought the fastest means of choosing. However, in taking the fast route, our reliability for a successful prescription drops substantially. And I'm going to give you an example. Here's a case of a knee injury. So I recently took a call from a long-standing client who had injured their knee after a slip in the snow. I took the call and heard the story and prescribed. The knee sounded like the opposite one that had had pain in the in, in it due to arthritis, and it actually was uh, re had a a knee replacement. She had a knee replacement. So this injury sounded so similar to the remedy that had helped for pain in the previous instance. So it was worse for going upstairs. And thinking immediately, Bryonia, um, because she had taken Bryonia before, is known for being worse for movement. And I just took the going upstairs as being worse for movement. And uh, knowing that the remedy had helped the opposite knee, it was worth trying. So three days later, I got the message that Bryonia had helped, but only after the first dose. On discussion of the symptoms, um, that going worse upstairs, the moving and climbing the stairs was, was true. But also the knee felt better for gentle walking after she would get up from bed or a chair. And this was going to negate the choice of Bryonia that I had made. It was also better for heat, and with a few other actual symptoms, the remedy chosen was rust tox. So the moral of the story is complex, but the main issue was that I listened to only one of the keynotes and not all of the symptoms. It actually took more time to prescribe, because it took three days to rule out the bad prescription, than if I had taken the time to properly take all the symptoms. Now, how much time would that actually have taken? Literally five more minutes. The big issue, I confess, is that I was driving and uh, didn't have time to pull over and take out my computer and all of that. Anyway, the moral is that actually doing uh, homeopathy using shortcuts actually takes more time. So just a little bit about Bryonia. Now, this is from Roberts. Um, rheumatic remedies. He writes, Bryonia is a major remedy in all types of rheumatic troubles where its modalities are mer marked. Modalities are the characteristics of what makes a symptom better or worse. It is not indicated in the onset of rheumatic troubles, but after a few days of increasing distress, distress in acute conditions, and at any time in chronic manifestations. In rheumatic complaints, the worse from motion is not unusual, but this modality, characteristic, 
together with the relief from lying on the painful side and the marked better from perspiring, are the strongest leaders for its usefulness. Leaders is another word for keynotes. So bryonia was a good arthritic remedy. It was good after an injury in an acute situation. It is, you know, worse for going upstairs, but it is generally better for resting, not moving. Whereas Rostox, if I read the characteristics in Robert's rheumatic remedies, we see, oops, I've just uh, blanked out my screen. Should be okay. I'm sure it's still recording, but I went to sleep. That should be better. I think it's still recording. So Rostox is one of the most valuable remedies in rheumatic conditions. It may be effective in every form of rheumatism and is often called for because it affects the whole body. It may be safely chosen when the marked indications are clear. The marked aggravations and ameliorations, meaning the things that make it worse and the things that make it better of this remedy point to its field of usefulness. So these might be, um, these are just ameliorating symptoms, better by rubbing, by heat, and when being warmed up by exercise, wrapping the head up warmly and dry heat. So just a few snippets of those characteristics. But more than this, we don't need to memorize these. There are simple ways to define um, what are the symptoms we can use to choose between these remedies in taking the symptoms of a case. And that's my goal, is to make this whole process very simple so that you can uh, choose a remedy reliably and quickly. So thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and see you at the next episode.